so you, you're, you're going to tell me then you want to have 10 minutes. Yep, right. We've got some seats at the front here if anybody needs any seats. <coughs> I thought it was going to be nice and easy being a small room. <laughs> Just a quick sound check. Can everybody hear me at the back okay? And can you hear me at the back there okay, Gordon? Good. I can't hear you, Gordon, which is really good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good afternoon everybody. Uh, my name's Linda Nicholl. Uh, I'm the Director of Safety Management Development for CHC Helicopter and I work out of my home in Australia. Um, with me today we've got Sigel and Lauren. Um, Sigel seems to have disappeared in a puff of smoke but we've still got Lauren, thankfully, um, from BCIT who's helping us and doing a magnificent job. So thank you uh, to Lauren. Uh, I'd like to just cover a couple of uh, items regarding safety, given that we are here on a safety conference. Um, the exit uh, at the back, so clearly, as Duncan Trapp mentioned today, if you hear the uh, fire alarm go off continuously, if you can all make your way outside, and hopefully it's not going to happen because none of you are smoking, are you? Um, okay. Uh, if you can all make sure that uh, you've do, you fill in the feedback forms, we'd be most grateful. 
uh, it's really important to uh, get your opinion uh, on, uh, on the actual uh, talk that Mike Adams is going to give. And we're really uh, delighted to uh, introduce Mike Adams today. Uh, it's his first time here um, in at Vancouver at the summit, uh, so welcome. Thank you. Um, Mike tells me, Mick tells me, Mick or Mike? Mick. 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 Mum says Michael, but Mick's fine. Uh, Michael when he's bad. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Mick is from, he tells me he's from the commercial sector, so he's bringing some different thoughts and ideas to the event, and he's also actually able to take some away with him. Uh, his background is uh, with Monarch Aircraft Engineering. I immediately said, are Monarch Airlines that used to fly out of Luton, are they still in business? He tells me yes, and that you've still got, you've got 50 aircraft. 40 aircraft. 40 aircraft, okay. Prior to his appointment as Managing Director, he was the Maintenance and Operations Director responsible for all operational elements of the business, including base and line maintenance, component overhaul, procurement and logistics. Quite a big job, actually. Um, Mick also leads the company's quality and safety management system, a director of First Aviation, and is a member of the Monarch Group Management Board. He's here to speak to us today about safety management leadership and how to achieve employee management, which actually affects all of us, quite frankly. So that's one reason why I wanted to introduce it, so that I could hear what he had to say. So welcome, Mick. Thank you very much, Linda, and thank you one and all. And uh, I have to say I feel very privileged to be here today in such a knowledgeable um, audience. So uh, ordinarily, this presentation, uh, already I'm getting fired up, so this would be, I, I do get animated in this, so um, be prepared for that. I'm very conscious that I'm in the way now, in between uh, now and perhaps when you're going to have a nice cold refreshment or some food. So I'll crack on, we'll get this finished in time, so don't worry about that. I would love to take questions as we go through, so if there's a particular moment you want to pick up, please do that, because it makes it a whole lot more interesting for everybody. Um, normally I crack through this in probably 10, 20 minutes. It's great that I've got an hour, let's work on an hour, because it enables that engagement and some talking through. Um, so, um, in 2005, I returned to Monarch and um, I moved into the office that was available at the time. And I wanted some blinds put up at the window, my door. And so I got old facilities guys and said, can I have some blinds put up in the office window, please? Uh, health and safety were straight on the phone, can't put blinds up at the window. Oh, why would that be then? Well, we just don't allow blinds up at the window. Now, if you saw my offices now, it's all very open, it's bright, it's glass. Very few people have offices, actually. Uh, but this was the time when there was offices and corridors, and the guy said, can't have blinds at the window. Why is that, then? Well, health and safety rules say you can't have blinds up at the window. OK, I'd like to see that rule. Can I just have a look at that rule? So if you can bring that rule to me, and it says you can't have blinds up at your office window, absolutely fine, I won't have blinds up at the office window. So the chap brought you a book, and the book was about this thick and it had about 15, maybe 20 post-its in this book. And he said, there's a reason you can't have blinds up at this window. So I said, okay. Off it. I said, no, 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 don't go away. Have a seat. I'll now read that book. Okay, because I want to read and I want to understand why it says you can't have blinds up at the window. So um, clearly, the book didn't say you can't have blinds up at the window. So the guy said, look, Mick, he said, the bottom line is, 50 yards down the corridor, there's a photocopier. And if it catches fire, you might not see the smoke. So I said to the guy this, the chances of that happening actually are very, very remote. <coughs> However, with 850 people that work for us, the chances of there being a grown man or lady sat in front of me crying because they've just suffered a bereavement or fallen on difficult financial times is actually moderately to medium. The guy looked at me and I said, that's how we run safety management in this organisation. So already my juices are flowing, because it's about people. Everything we talk about when it comes to safety is people. This is a people presentation. M Savvy, so M Savvy, uh, I will tell you later in the presentation how we ended up with M Savvy, uh, but Monarch Standard and Values Information. So it's a safety management system that's based on values personal values or core business values. And regardless whether you're a single aircraft operator, a rotary or fixed wing, or major uh, airline, 
the message is the same. So regardless of where you come from, the message is the same. This you'll be pleased to know is pretty much the only slide with words on it. So leading by example, being prepared to be held accountable. Making SMS a company theme rather than something the guys have to deal with. Investing in employee ideas, making, them, making this investment, deliver that investment and let them see that you're taking on their ideas. Involving employees in safety strategies, media workshops. I'll come back to that later. Making SMS information user friendly, relative. Re relevant, I should say, and dynamic. Encouraging the theme of wanting to work safely rather than because you've to been told to work safely. Um, encourage an understanding that best people can and actually probably will be the ones that make the mistake, and I'll build on that. Relentless management determination, validating you're doing what you say you're doing, and perhaps that will be a bit audience participating in that later, and then returning to one. So, leadership and accountability. Here's a very simple, very simple chart. So on the vertical axis, I've got uh, leadership effort and example setting, driving best practice. And on the horizontal scale, time and cultural change. So there's been an event, and it could be today. It could be an accident. It could be a maintenance error. Something's happened. So your energy levels are up. So I'm talking to you now as leaders, as managers, as team leaders, as technicians. Everybody in my organisation has seen this presentation. Directors, board, managers, leaders, lean hands, engineers, apprentices as part of their induction. There's been an event, so the effort's up. You'll be writing things down from this uh, conference in the, in the next couple of days and you'll be taking them back to your office and you'll be thinking about that. And then what happens? The day job. So you've got all this energy, you've got all these things you're going to do and then you get sucked to a commercial discussion or sales aren't quite where they're going to be, or you've got to go on a business trip. So something else happens. There's another event. You don't need to put as much effort in, perhaps. Or maybe you're just kind of getting tired and you're getting really drawn into the day-to-day -day running of the business. And then the day job kicks in. Now things are going backwards culturally now because people are starting not to believe you. Because at the first point you were saying, oh, I'm going to be there, I'm going to do this, this is what we're going to do as an organisation, but you haven't been visible actually. And you have, you've not been walking the talk and you've not been leading by example. So people are starting to lose faith in, in their leadership. Another event, and on it goes. So it's extremely difficult for the people in this room and outside of this room to remain focused on safety management. But safety management is your day job. It's not a bolt-on. It's not something, it's not a department. It has to be part of your daily job. Uh, there was a question this morning about how many safety, um, recruiting good people for quality. I mean, I've got 850 people working in my company. I've got 850 ha safety officers. I've got two guys that help coordinate and run, but I've got 850 safety officers in my organisation. But for 3%. And I'll come back to that because we did a, a yearly employee survey. So, you know, you can't be, as a leader, visible when the wheels come off. You have to be visible at all times. It has to be part of your daily job. So let's talk about this train wreck. So the wheel came off. The split pin, they didn't put the split pin in. Can't be my fault, because I don't do shifts. Not my fault. Has to be your problem. You're the engineers, you're the technicians, nothing to do with me and my management team because I don't work shifts. The fact that you operate the hangar lock of backstreet garage has got nothing to do with safety. Husbandry and housekeeping has got nothing to do with his split pin at all. It's not my problem, your problem. And procedures, I've got procedures up the yin yang. I've got a book of procedures. Don't tell me you didn't have procedures, they were there for you to use. And I've got a library. You can go there at two in the morning when the circadian rhythm is at the lowest point and you can read to your heart's content. So don't tell me you didn't have the documentation. And I sent an email. <laughs> I, I sent an email to every employee. And it says, remember to put the split pin in. And it also says, if you don't put the split pin in, you will be challenged. And I demand a response to this email so that I know you've read it. So I know you've read it.
you're working on an aircraft, you've got 5,000 task cards. You're working on two aircraft at the same time, you've got 10,000 task cards. Not my problem, you decided to take on too much work. Two aircraft came in, it was your problem, nothing to do with me. You decided to do that because you're an engineer. You thought you could cope with that, and that's where this all ends up. So I'm here today to tell you that I am the accountable manager of Monarch Aircraft Engineering and I take my job so seriously it is just untrue. It is my job to provide facilities, tools, equipment, documentation, information and resource and an acceptable working environment. It's your job to use that. That's all I'm asking. Nothing else. If all you remember from this presentation, remember I'm talking to my engineers and my board and the managers, if all you take away from this is please use the facilities that I provide, we're in a good place. Don't do it because they said so though. Do it because you want to. What do you do when you see one of those? What do you do when you see one of those? <laughs> Why do you slow down? You don't want to check it. You don't want points. You don't want to be penalised. It's a rule. What do you do when you see one of those? Why? It's a value. So this is about compliance and values. Working safely because you want to, rather than because you're being told to. Use the maintenance manual because you want to. There's a rule. It's a book of rules. Use the book because you want to. There's a guy doing a boroscope. There's somebody else doing a boroscope. The difference between the two, though, is the bottom right-hand corner here, when this person's finished, she's going to say, right, stitch him up, walk away, and there'll be a team of people that's going to work on that patient. The guy in the top left-hand corner, because he's an engineer and he never makes mistakes, and he's the best engineer that there is, the temptation for that guy at two in the morning outside on the line, freezing cold, pouring rain, the temptation for him to do that boroscope and close that up at the same time is enormous. <laughs> And it's about getting the guys to understand that that temptation exists. And that the best engineer would actually say, do you know what, I might make a mistake. Can you come and check this for me? That's the better engineer. There's a guy, a scuba diver, the best scuba diver in the world. Dives all the deepest, darkest, bluish ocean, sees all the fish there are to see. He is the best diver in the world. What's the last thing he'll do before he jumps in the water? He'll turn to his mate and say, check that regulator for me. Otherwise he could end up in that situation. So let's move that, let's develop that theme. There's a, there's a bloke doing something on that looks grey and, well, just a bloke doing something with a dirty tabard and dirty ovals. There's a Monarch aircraft engineer with a safety harness working on an A300 leading edge. How do you want to be seen? Do you want to be seen as a bloke at work? Do you want to see it as a bloke doing something? Or do you want to see it be seen as a professional aircraft engineer? How do you want to be seen by your peer group? There's a, there's a box of things. A box of things. I mean, arguably it's a toolkit. There's an aircraft engineer's toolkit. Now this particular one, when we introduced this, the, I did a, a, line, a line visit, I was at Manchester, and I, I was walking up the steps. Um, this hadn't long been, issued, uh, been rolled out in the organisation, and I was doing a, a line visit, and I was walking up the steps to the aircraft. Mick Walsh was the engineer, he's 43 years old. He came running, he said, Mick, come and, come and have a look, come and have a look at the back of my van. Come and have a look at this. The guy's 43. He opened the van and showed me this toolkit. He was so pleased that he'd kind of gone on the journey. You know, and that, and that you know, that is... For me, that's a very, very special moment. So that's one out of my 150. 
I've now got 849 to go. And remember this relentless effort. Now what that did, that actually led to this. So uh, Birmingham, we've got 27,232 individually identified tools supplied by the organisation. Now the cultural challenge there was quite enormous because you've got all these engineers that built up their toolkits for years, haven't they? They've even made their own tools. You know, don't tell me you know what I need, mate, because I made one of these years ago and it saved us so many times. But actually, the precursor to this was to get the shadowboarding of your own tool. So there's an understanding why we're doing this. We're not supplying these tools because you don't have the right tools. We're supplying these tools for safety. So the precursor to this, and this was a significant investment, was to get this shadowboard thing going in the personal toolkits. Once the understanding was there, we could then invest into this. And the guys picked the tools for these kits. And think about this, if you've got 200 guys working in a hangar, on a four-on, four-off shift, and they've all got toolkits. You know how big these toolkits can be with some of these kits? I mean, they're like, you need a lorry to move some of these. But if you've got 100 people off shift, you've got 100 toolkits in the hangar that you're climbing over that are not in use. The efficiency gains through having this and just having floor space has helped to return on that investment. Any questions? Essential SM tool, SMS tools and communications. Now remember, I said it's my job to make sure the information is provided. But it is not right if the engineer has to go find that information. There's too much. It is the organisational responsibility to push that information to the engineers. Somebody talked about procedures uh, this morning, asking when you've got so many, you know, you've got kind of over-engineered, over-proceduralised your organisation. There's a really good question, actually. Um, you know, it's the organisational responsibility, it's the management team's responsibility to push this information to the engineer. It's not fair for a guy to come in on a Saturday night, start a shift at 10 o'clock, and be expected to catch up on the whole week's events, or technical bulletins, or quality information. It's not reasonable to expect a man to retain that knowledge, especially if he's certifying three or four or five different aircraft types. And just think about that in the event of an incident. If you, you know, you stood there and somebody said, well, is it really reasonable to expect a guy to have to go and look at 400 risk assessments before he does a boroscope? So you press the button and then this opens up and there's a triangle there. It's called business, uh, I've got a pointer on there. I think. Well, there we go, this little um, triangle there. So you'd click on that and then you'd go to this big triangle. And on that triangle, forgive my, my back, ladies and gentlemen, there's uh, various procedures, terms of reference, um, GORs and all the rest of it. And at the top there we've got SMS which is M Savvy. So right at the top of our triangle is M Savvy. So you'd click on that M Savvy um, tab, tile there and then you get the circle, you get the wheel. So this is our SMS wheel. So as you go around that wheel you've got report an event, so you click on that it tells you how to report an event, health and safety, uh, scorecard etc, uh, safety awareness, so there'll be fatigue, significant seven, FAA um, documentation in there, training, um, quality information bulletins, safety culture, so we do a survey quite regularly actually in the organisation so we know culturally where our organisation sits and I'll come back to that in a second, I'll show you how that survey looks. Um, safety performance monitoring, so this is good this one, this is where, this is housekeeping standards, so this is where you've got hangers being measured against each other for housekeeping, so you've got engineers that own part of the hangar, so there's, there's kind of a bit of a competition going on, so that's a good thing, but they're taking ownership of their environment, so that works really well. And then you've got your error reporting mechanism. The, 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 the one I'd like to point out though is, is the, um, and I can talk to anybody about this after the presentation this week if you wish, um, the, um, the red nose, the, the one in the middle there. So that's, that's the current hot topic. So within 24 hours, at the worst case, if there's an incident in my organisation, within 24 hours, everybody will know about it. And I insist that that happens within 24 hours. And there's one mechanism, and there's an example. So there's a, um, an Airbus um, fuel tank panels, underwing fuel tank panels, you may know this, some of you. The anchor nuts are offset, so if you drill straight up, if you're trying to drill a screw up, you'll actually go through the skin, you could damage the skin. So that was a meter, so we generated this um, information, and it came out as a hot topic. And then as you log on, when you come on shift, it will tell you 
you need to go and read that hot topic. And remember, this is the management's responsibility to push that information to the engineers. It's not fair to expect him in the middle of his shift, he's departing 30, 40 aircraft, or he's working a major sea check, to think, hang on a minute, what's the latest hot topic? I need to go and search through the files. So that's pushed to you as you log on. Okay, so it appears everywhere in the organisation. But it also appears in the toilets. But not anyone's toilet, everyone's toilet. That's my toilet. I'm not afraid to tell you, that's the toilet on the top floor of building 105, where I sit and the directors and one or two others. But it's actually quite interesting that, because when I visitors come to look around the organisation or, or prospective customers and we talk about our safety culture, we don't necessarily talk about this, they might take a, a comfort break, we feed them lots of coffee actually, to get into the toilets, but you know, um, but they, they'll see that it's true, we're not afraid to say, actually, things go wrong. And that's really, really, touch, somebody touched on that again this morning, you know, um, do we measure what's available or should we measure other things? I thought it was a really good point. You know, we should not be afraid to say and share openly that things haven't quite gone according to plan on this particular one. There was a mistake made. And the guy didn't do it on purpose, did he? I mean, the guy didn't drive to work to, to damage an A320 wing. In fact, that's an interesting point, isn't it? When you interview people, they're great, aren't they? They must be, because you give them a job. That's right. So they're really good. And then three years down the line, you're going, oh, I'm not sure about this bloke. I'm not sure he gets it. Well, what's happened to that person? The organisation has had that effect. It's not the person. It's a good person. Because you gave him the job. So something's happened in the organisation. So if you've got that situation, you need to take a really honest look at your organisational culture. Because guys don't drive... Like guys and ladies, I should say, I'm sorry. People do not drive to work to make a mistake. Actually, they drive to work to do a good job. So there's the um, fuel tank. Uh, this one was an engine mat um, left in. Who would leave an engine mat and an intake of an RB211 to start the engine? Who in heaven's name would have done that? You know, it was two in the morning, it was freezing cold, it was pouring rain, the, front, the apron lights weren't working, okay? Lots of, uh, I could tell, I could do a presentation just about that, but the guys come up with an idea of getting orange mats and they're booked out on a tooling control now. This one I'm going to come back to. This is a, an A321 variable bleed valve um, lubrication task. I'm not sure if there's anybody familiar with the uh, V2500 engine, but even in the maintenance manual, it will tell you, be very careful, you could drop your screwdriver bit into the engine. It tells you to put tape around the screwdriver bit to stop it falling in the engine. Um, we, we had an unfortunate event where the engineer dropped the bit in the engine and this was about 8 o'clock in the morning, the guy was absolutely 110% convinced that bit was in the engine. By 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the entire team had managed to convince themselves it was nowhere near that engine. That's a human factor. And it's fascinating how that story unfolded throughout the day. Fascinating. 1.6 million euros that cost. And I'm often asked, did you sack the guy that did that? And the answer is, it's just cost me 1.6 million euros to train him, why would I sack him? <laughs> Think about that. And now there's an advocate in the organisation. So, I've got two. There's now 848. Think about that. In fact, you know, the guy's done really well. And we've had a couple of instances of this since where the bit's been dropped in the engine. And the whole escalation process now has worked like an absolute dream. Customer made aware, take the engine off, sent it for a tear down, all those kind of things. Yes, it's very <coughs> expensive, but not 1.6 million euros. You know? But there's an interesting point here for me, and it is an OEM one. And there'll be two issues here where I'll, I'll challenge the OEMs. I think it's unfair, it's unreasonable for an OEM to say, be careful, you might drop the bit in this particular task, use tape. Redesign the engine, you know. Um, so there's a toolbox one, you've seen that one. Um, headsets, now this one was an interesting one um, because actually 
this was one of our meter workshops, and one of the guys suggested we should buy some um, improved headsets for pushbacks. And it was actually functions. This was it was a seven six seven elevator got smashed, and um, I'll come back to that in a second. And one of the guys suggested headsets. Now actually that wasn't really the fix, but it was a case of the guy suggested it. Spend five hundred dollars, get some headsets, because you know he, he will see that we've gone with his idea. So I'm now eight hundred and forty seven. Okay. Um, this one is a good OEM one. So this was a nose gear sensor on an A320 where the maintenance manual and IPC disagreed with each other. And this is a really important issue for me because I'm saying to my engineers, you must use the maintenance manual. And they're saying, I'd love to admit, but this was wrong last month and it's still wrong now. Isn't that unfair? That's not right. So this is where I say the OEMs and the industry has a, a responsibility for speeding up that process and let's get a common platform for all the maintenance manuals and documentation please, that would be very good. Uh, this was just a documentation one, so the whole N savvy approach and the signs in the toilets and you know you log on it tells you the sign drives you there and it just helps re reassure um, or I should say um, reinvigorate some of your procedures that, you know so we've fallen off the track a bit on some of our documentation so we sent this, this out there. This was a, a slide in a Boeing 767, or 757, so the slide was deployed in the aircraft. I mean, that would kill you. Um, you know, and it was, um, uh, the guys come up with some ideas. So, so if I take away, so all these ones here, this is where the guys have come up with ideas for the maintenance area. So we've seen that investment go back into the business. So this is how we start to encourage the engagement. Is it working? Okay. Jim? Yeah? JB's coming in here a bit late. I've put you down there for it for the okay. turn around and the pre-flight. Yep. All right? So you probably want to get off because you've been running a bit late. Okay, mate. I'll get on that. Cheers, mate. Okay. Hi. Can you see if the engineer's sitting out there somewhere? We've got a problem with the weather radar. Yeah, we'll do. Thanks very much. Captain, the number one said you wanted to have a word. Oh, hi there, yeah. Um, there's a problem with the weather radar. It seems to be jammed, it's not sweeping. Can you have a look? I can't. I'll, uh, I'll go and get our avionics guy, he can have a look at it for you, alright? Okay, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah. Oil pressure returning to base. 
Okay. Yeah, hi Mark, it's Katie here. I'm coming in galley secure for landing. Thanks, yeah, expect to land in about two minutes. Okay, thank you. Jim, um, 4,000 feet on the climb out, all quantity diminished, followed by all pressure, loss, we had in flight shut down and uh, return, so there's something wrong with your system on the number one. Okay. Can you right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're going to get that checked out. Thanks. Passions on, but we've got we're in air turn back, so I've got to report it to right. So yeah, sure. We'll sit tight for the time being. If you can keep us informed as, uh, as soon as you know anything. I will, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry about that. We'll let Ops know. All right, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, cheers. What was the problem there then, mate? Oh, mate, I've just come back from JB. There's all all over the place. All under the engine. There's all all, all over the floor. I've, um, I've had a quick look round, but... What, burst pipe? Or? Well, I wish it was. It looks like I've left the cap off. I've opened the oil panel. What, you've left the cap off? That's all I can think of. We must have been... I've opened the oil panel, and the cap's just dangling down there. It's not on. The number one came down and asked me to go and speak to the captain. So you remember leaving it off? I guess it must have been. Do you remember, I don't remember putting it on? I don't remember putting it back on. I, sh I remember closing the panel, but I don't remember putting the cap back on when she came down to see me. That's not like you, mate. I know. We'll have to report it. We'll have to, we'll have to, there'll have to be a meter or an investigation at least into that. Oh, no. Go and sit down, mate, and we'll sort about it. I'll, talk, I'll ring Main Trail and inform what's been going on. OK, mate. OK, so the, um, the video now goes on to talk about different um, methods of filling uh, different engines, oil replenishment, and one thing or another. Um, I, this is one of my enormously proud moments, but this is where I get the hairy arm, because this is my team. Um, they're hugely engaged with what we do in safety management. It was their idea. They filmed it. Uh, one of the technicians has got his own camera. That's done on a sort of home camera kind of thing. Um, it's a very special video that every employee has seen that video. Uh, everybody sees it on their induction. Um, people see it on their recurrent training. The apprentices see that. Um, Andy Delty, Carl Breck, Mark Harris, his wife Kate Harris is actually uh, a hostess. and. She finished that film and said, you know, I never realised how my interrupting an engineer could introduce risk into the operation. So there was a, a spin-off from that as well, which is really good. Um, and then you've got John Marsh, uh, Andy Toll and uh, James Moore, who, who I think deserves an Oscar, this lad, because you'd think he'd actually left that oil cap off, wouldn't you? I mean, the lad was next to tears. Um, so, yeah, really proud. And we did some for working at height as well, safety harnesses and all the rest of it. And this is that point about making it relevant. You know, if you stick a group of aircraft engineers 
in a room, a health and safety session, and talk about ladders and buildings and show bricks and scaffolding, you're just going to lose them in a, in a heartbeat. Make the training, make the, the information you provide relevant to their day-to-day -day life. So evolution. So this little green card here is about this big. Um, it is our seven items. So from all of our media data, we determined that that's the seven drivers for maintenance errors in the organisation. Um, so what we then did, we, didn't, we said let's, let's spend less time and less horsepower doing investigations, and I use that carefully, that comment, but put more, and put more energy behind the proactive, you know, what are we doing to root cause. So here's, here's the seven items. That piece of paper, every apprentice that joins my organisation, so they do their initial training and then they come to the hangar environment, they're in a room, there'll be the 10 or 12 apprentices in the table in the middle, I have the entire management team stood around the outside of the room and I walk around, I give every one of those apprentices a piece of paper. And I say, there it is, there's a piece of paper, there's seven items on. And I give every apprentice that piece of paper. And I say, if all you do when you're in aviation, if all you do in this organisation is those seven things, you will not be involved in a maintenance error. You will not be involved in an accident. And when I walk through the hangars, and I walk through and I see you with your toolkit, I might just say to you, show me the green bit of paper. And I've got engineers that are apprentices that are now two or three years out of their time have still got that bit of paper. So it's only a piece of paper, it costs nothing. A bit of colour ink, a bit of time, and seven thoughts. And then we've evolved. So we've rebranded now, so we're significant six now. So I'm going to share with you the most probable, the six causes of a, a maintenance error in Monarch Aircraft Engineering. Okay, and what we do. So we've branded it, we've made it, and somebody talked earlier uh, this morning again, forgive me, I, I forget whether it was uh, John or, or um, Derek, was it? I can't remember now. They talked about the youth and we have to communicate in a different way now. And think about it. And again, that is a really interesting point as to how we communicate. So it's modern, it's funky. Um, so is there a significant six? So waiting inspections. There will be no tasks left in Monarch Aircraft Engineering when you go off shift that have not been signed, seen, inspected and signed off. It will not happen. It will not happen. If there's not sufficient time to close off that task and sign for it, don't start it. And I'll come to handovers in a moment. In my, in my earlier days, where I'd come in in the morning after a night shift and I'd find cards that hadn't been signed but had been completed, I'd take those cards, jump in my car, drive around that guy's house and knock that front door till he woke up. And I'd say, you need to sign those. You only have to do that once or twice. And then the message is clear. You know, don't leave things for other people to certify. It's not fair, it's not right. And it's, you know, error prone, very much so. Clipboards, and again, somebody touched on it again, it's a fascinating story, this is, but clipboards. Every engineer in my organisation will have a clipboard, and on that clipboard will be the master card, not a copy, the master card, and the maintenance manual, or IPC. It is a requirement. But remember, don't do it because I'm saying so, do it because you want to. Understand the benefit of that. Mastercard. We have no copy cards. And the engineers say, well, they get dirty. And I say, well, don't let them get dirty. Keep them clean. It's a Mastercard. And the reason you do that is because if you lose a Mastercard, you know the task has not been done. You are correct in that you should think this has not been done. We have lost the card. If you've got a duplicate card, the temptation, because you're, you know, you're up against time scale, you're delivering an aircraft, passengers in a terminal, you know, it's all come together, you're, and on a major check you might have two or three thousand cards. You know, the temptation, the human error element, the temptation to, well there's a duplicate, you know, I, I saw Johnny doing that, I'm sure. The temptation to use that card, to take that temptation and quite, it's a master card only. Task staging, again, touched on this morning. So if, you're, if you are starting a task and you cannot finish it, you must task stage that. So you break that down into various tasks as part of the handover. 
shift continuity. So, you know, it cannot be that, let's say you're working on a four-on, four-off shift, that everybody's on a four-on, four-off shift. Asking for trouble. You cannot have a crew finish on a Friday and a completely new crew comes in on a Saturday. Cannot happen. You've got to change things, so you've got to have some overlaps. You've got to have some shifts that sit across the top. You cannot do that. Absolutely essential, that one. Uh, housekeeping. So we talked about the housekeeping and husbandry. It's a mindset. So what we do is, half an hour before the end of shift, so if you're finishing shift at 7 o'clock in the evening, everybody stops work and starts to clear up and return the tools. Now initially, the guys go, oh, this is good, finishing work over, this is good. But it's getting the understanding why you're doing that. Leave the workplace how you'd expect to find it. Put the tools back. Clean the work environment. Return the master card and the clipboard to the production control office. And then induction. So everybody would see this presentation. Everybody would see that video and other video, the videos. Even our contract labour. All of our contract labour. We do use contract labour in the winter. Uh, quite a large number actually. But every single contractor will go through an induction process. You might think that's a huge cost, but it's the cost of not doing it. And it's also important they feel part of the team, part of the monarch story. And we have an app. There you go. We've now got an app. So you can download that now. We've had it for a while. Uh, monarch MRO uh, on your iPhone or your, uh, whatever you've got. And if you will click on that app, you've got login, MSAV in our services. And the reason we did this is because our younger, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say that now in today's world, but our younger element, the entry level people, you know, they're still at the pub, they'll be at the pub now, and they'll click on M Savvy, and who knows, they might start talking about the significant six, and they'll be talking about it amongst their peer group, and the things that you can learn from. And we validate everything that I'm telling you we do today, I know we do, because we validate it every week. Every single week, we talk to uh, at least 10 engineers, and it's an interesting point, this, and one, uh, perhaps a takeaway for you, this, is we found that if you work, uh, this table works in the bottom up, so a check manager would be the more senior, so this would be the guy that does the final release on the aircraft, then you've got technicians and then mechanics. And you'll see from, the, I mean, this is a snapshot, so it's, it's, a, it's a cut of a, a rather large um, spreadsheet. But what we found is the level of comprehension, perhaps won't surprise you, was higher at this level, that it's management, junior management, the mechanic. Okay, so that's, okay, maybe there's an understanding there. You don't understand somebody in the management position to have a better comprehension of what this is all about. But the, the level of information is obviously not being cascaded through the business as it should be. So that tool immediately told us we need to do something in our communication piece. So we introduced toolbox chat, so every morning, every evening, as a shift start, there's a toolbox chat. We go through the, the issues of the day, guys working at high, NDT, so be careful, or fuel tanks open, whatever it might be, or there's a critical task occurring in the next shift. So that happens. So that helped us address that, that um, lack of information cascade. And that's really important to me. So I'm MD, I'm sat there, I'm the council manager. You know, I, I mean, it probably won't surprise you, but I walk to the hangar two or three times a day. Um, because I think that's my job, and I think that's my responsibility. But it's also, it's important that I test, I test what we do. Interesting thing about a meter is this, you know, is, is if, if, let's talk about smashing an, a, a flat. Let's talk, use a scenario where somebody lowers a flat onto a stand. Isn't it interesting that the meter investigation goes straight to mechanic, tell me why you moved that flat. You know, put the customer phone to me, so the, the acid test of my investigative process, and this is a secret I'll share with you, is when the team that do the investigations, and by the way, it's cross-pollination investigation the media, so we don't, it's not quality to do the investigation with the engineers, or they'll do it with the guys. Um, the acid test for me is when we have an accident or an incident, uh, an incident, and they come to me and say, Mick, can we interview you first? And then I'll go, cracked it. We've had an accident, we've had an incident, but they've got that right. Because that's where it starts. And this comes right back to that accountability place. I'm happy to be, I'm not happy there's an incident, 
but I'm happy to be tested and challenged in my role. But that challenge should permeate right the way through the organisation. So just as it is my responsibility for resource, facilities and one thing and another, it's the engineer's responsibility for certifying a car before he goes home. Or not starting the task if he can't complete it. Do you understand the message that I'm trying to say there? It, it's, it's, you know, I can only get the guys to do that if I'm prepared to do my piece. It's not fair, come back to the train. You know, it's not fair to be seen only when the wheels come off. That's not right. I'm, I've just had the red flag, so I need to move on. So, perfect timing, 10 minutes to go. So, leadership is about being seen. If you want engagement, you've got to be seen, you've got to be accountable, you've got to be prepared to be challenged as you walk through the organisation. That's the accountability piece. If you do it any other way, you can end up in a blame culture, and that's no good for anyone. Um, work safely because you want to, not because you're told to. Use the manuals because you want to, not because somebody tells you you must. It's the management and the company's responsibility to push information to your people. It's not reasonable to expect them to go and draw that level of information out on a day-to-day -day basis. And get the guys to do it for you. As I said, I've got 850 safety officers in my organisation. There is a 3%, I'll share that with you now. Uh, the last survey we did of 850, there was 3% that said they're not happy with our safety culture. Now I, I looked at it and said, so let's go do that. Let's, let's, let's see what, I don't care who it is, but if there's 3% out there, that's 3% we've got to fix. And keep it relevant and uh, sexy and, and uh, dynamic. Change it as regularly as you can. The message doesn't have to change, but maybe the tools do. Thank you very much. I hope that's the beginning for some of you. Thanks very much. So there you go. Uh, managed to get you out early. So um, I, it's entirely up to you. If there's any questions, we can do a Q&A for 10 minutes if you wish, or five minutes, wherever you wish. Any questions, have to take them. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so the question, if you didn't get it, was is on the, the example of a flat being damaged, we use the engineers to help with quality to investigate that uh, maintenance error. So, um, where would we get the people from? And it would not be the person that's involved in the incident. Um, we would, so let's say, for example, uh, we'd get guys from Manchester. Uh, a technician or mechanic to come to Luton and investigate that incident if it was Luton or, or vice, vice versa. What we then do, we have a round table where everybody, everybody that we consider was involved in the incident, in whatever way they meet, round table to share openly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if, okay, so the question was, I, I'd be happy if they started with me on an investigation. So the question they should be asking me is, have you got adequate resource for the capacity or the demand that you've got in the organisation? Have you invested uh, the right extent for the tooling and equipment? Are you using the equipment specified by the OEM or are you using alternative means of compliance? Um, what kind of fatigue management have you got in place? How many men did you have running that, people I should say, running that particular aircraft check? What was the mix of technicians, lead engineers? So all of the things that I'm there to provide in my responsibility, I expect to be asked that question. Okay. And then that, that for each role, I believe that should cascade that. Yes, sir. Okay, so the question was, how do you prevent stall where you've got the frontline managers, supervisors that are very close to the um, mechanics, I guess, so that relationship uh, might get in the way. Um, this is about accountability and being responsible for your role. So you can have, I mean, there isn't a guy that I wouldn't buy a drink that works in my organisation. There isn't a guy that would knock my door before he walked in. 
So it's understanding one's role, understanding one's position in the organisation. Um, and you know, that's part of the that's part of the progression in the organisation. I mean, you might be a great engineer, you might be the best engineer, but do you really understand what the next stage of progression means for you? Do you really understand what that means, what your responsibility is going to be? Now that's my job to make sure that's clear to you. You know, it's not right that I say to you after an event, well hang on a minute, you know, you should have thought about that anyway, Neil, mate. That's my job. Okay, no questions? Okay. Uh, the question, great question. Um, increasingly, engineers seem to spend more time in the office on computers rather than outside of, on the. Um, that is, you know, I don't mind the question, please don't mind the answer. It is absolutely an organisational issue, that. Um, you know, it is not right that you've got highly paid engineers having gone through several years of training, type and non type, to then have them sat in front of a computer all day. They absolutely, so what we do, I mean our zonal stations are out by the aircraft. So our check management offices will only have the check manager and we have a check management support engineer. They're the only two that will be permitted in that office actually. Unless there's a need for a, a dialogue. But we have zonal stations by the aircraft. So wings, the station will be there. Nose to tail, the station will be there with the documentation and with the, the digital, with the computer, whatever, parts, demand, etc, etc. Good question, Matt. It's a good question. We have to work really hard at that. I mean, there's a cost there, isn't there? But it is that production efficiency because if they're on the floor, if the supervisors are out there on the floor, you're going to drive production efficiency. You're going to get that back. So you might want one or two heads, one or two extra engineers, but you will get that by, back in productivity and reduce accident, reduce issues. And the customers want to see it anyway. Any more questions? Ah, there's a really good question. So the question was sustainability, long-term view, how do we keep going, what we're going, we're, we're um, so here's the question you ask yourself. If I was to go and leave for six months, what would happen in the organisation? That's the question. And that's a good question to ask yourself in your place of work. If you were on the detachment, and some of you, you guys will know this better than I with your remote locations, I'm sure, where you visit a location and then you're gone. That's the real test, and that's about how you manage your team and lead your team. Because it's my job to work myself out of a job. And that has to be clear. And the only way to do that is to get the guys, share knowledge, share the information, share knowledge, get them engaged, get them involved in the business, don't keep it to my, you know, let them become succession so that when I'm not there, the business is running efficiently. It's not right that I sit in my office and keep all this strategic information to myself. You know, it's absolutely right that I share that so if not there they can operate the business. And now and again you're back in track, you turn up after your six months, you might have to nudge one or two things in. Remember the culture pulse? You go back in, you, you know, but you won't have to go back in so heavy and won't have to be for such a long period of time. It's just a nudge back in the trend line. You know, the winter season for us, I mean, we'll do three quarters of a million man hours perhaps this year. You know, at the end of a busy um, winter, you know, it's true the hangers aren't as tidy as when they were started, when the season started. But they're tidier than they were last year. And they'll be tidier again next year. Thank you, question again. Any questions? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think that that was a really interesting uh, talk by Mick, and uh, I hope that you'll put your hands together and uh, as a thank you to him, we'd like to... Those of you who don't have a feedback form, can you put your hands up, please? Has everybody filled one in? Pretty please. Okay, so can you make sure that you fill it in before you leave? Thank you very much. Um, if you just see uh, Lauren at the back, anybody who hasn't got a form. Right, thanks very much. Thank you. I'm going to ask for a kind of wasn't expecting. Oh no, thank you. Can do something, can't we?
Let me turn that off. You enjoying it? Yeah, no, it was good. Yeah, it was good. Very good. Um, I'll just leave it. That's my computer.